Welcome, guys, back to the Grateful Living podcast. Today, I am thankful to have Sarah Graysdorf. Sarah is the CEO and founder of Hold Dut, Hold Dut, an e-commerce brand designing and producing women's workwear with real pockets. Sarah was also named as one of Boston Inno's 25 Under 25 in 2020. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to be on. Awesome. Thank you. So take us back to the beginning, where you grew up, your family situation, and uh, what type of kid you were. Sure. So I'm originally from outside Washington, D.C. in a town called Bethesda, Maryland. I was born and raised there my entire life, lived in the same house um, my whole life. I um, started going to an elementary school that was connected with the church that my family belonged to, um, ended there in sixth grade, and then started going to an all-girls school um, in middle school and high school, um, which I eventually graduated from. Um, I have a little sister. She's uh, 17, about to be 18. Um, and my whole family's always been super close. Um, we have a dog. His name is Peyton. Um, he's part Chihuahua, part Beagle, and he's deaf. So um, he doesn't really know his own name, but um, <laughs> he, he you know, knows that we're his family. So uh, we've always been, been close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you went to an all girls school. Uh, what was that like as you, as you look back? Were there any benefits to that? Or, I mean, you know, I, obviously, I, I don't know what your plans are, but if you do ever have children, you think that's something if you had a daughter, you would you would have her attend? Yeah, I loved my time at an all-girls school. I don't think it's for everybody, but um, I think it was definitely a great fit for me. I think a lot of the confidence that I had going into college um, definitely came from, from the education that I got, um, you know, not really having to compete with boys in a classroom or anything like that. I, I went on to study computer science where there were a lot of boys. So it was definitely a change in experience, but I definitely was prepared well. It was a really rigorous school. So they call it like a college preparatory school. So um, lots of AP classes, um, a lot of homework, a lot of work in general, um, but was also able to be pretty well-rounded. I did the plays, I was on student council. Um, so I think overall it was a really good experience for me me, I think, um, you know, seeing my sister, my family ended up moving to, to Massachusetts once I started college, and now she goes to a co-ed school, having been at the same school I was at back in Bethesda, um, and she's doing a lot better in, in the co-ed school. So I think, um, yeah, I'd love to send a future daughter to an all-girls school. I think um, we'll just see if it makes sense. Yeah. Was it was it a tough transition? Just curious, like going to, to BU after after that, was it, was it, or was it just pretty seamless? You, you mean having gone to the all girls school? Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. now you're in, I mean, computer science, as you said, uh, a lot of males in that. And was that an adjustment? I think I, you know, knew, uh, I, I had guy friends growing up. So, so it's, it's not like I had been like in an isolation. <laughs> um, I think I think in a lot of ways I had been told that there was all this sexism in computer science, it being so male dominated and was kind of naive to that going into college being like, well, I've only ever been around, you know, girls and, and, and like none of that's ever happened to me. And then I got there and yeah, there's like random snide remarks. And, and I think a lot of young gentlemen were very like well-intentioned, but um, didn't really know what they were saying. And so um, ended up having to kind of face some of that, but but was able to go into all those conversations with the confidence that I had gained from my all girls education. So I think I was able to let them kind of roll off me more than I might have if I had had to be, have been dealing with them um, from the time that I was in middle or high school. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool perspective. Especially given what you do today, was entrepreneurship something you were introduced to as a young kid? Is that something that like maybe your parents were entrepreneurs or how did that come into your horizon? Yeah, my parents are not entrepreneurs. Um, my dad's been in education for the last like 10 to 15 years. And my mom is um, was like an independent photographer for a while and, and now does social justice work. Um, but I somehow have always been pretty entrepreneurial um growing up i start i well i would start not really like carry through a lot of business ideas so um in fifth grade that was what i would say is like my first business um i would bake um, like brownies and cookies and then bring them to school and sell them to my classmates 
Um, and I remember having a meeting with like the small team that I had assembled with our, um, and we all met, went to meet with the headmaster of our elementary school, basically being like, can we sell our fake goods in the school store? And he was like, you do not have a food license. And I was like, oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So um, he basically was like, no, but I was like, I keep selling to my classmates. And then I guess word got to my fifth grade teacher that I wasn't supposed to be doing this anymore. And I remember walking into class one day and in front of the whole class, he was like, Sarah, you cannot sell big goods to your classmates anymore. And I was like, okay, not two minutes later, one of my classmates walks in to pay for her brownies, which cost a dollar with a hundred pennies. So like, it was this huge display of her being like, here are a hundred pennies to pay for your brownies. And maybe like, I'm not allowed to sell these anymore. Um, so that was like my first business. Um, but growing up, I had like a lot of different ideas. I wanted to do dog treats and make homemade lip balm and make pasta. And it was so funny kind of looking back is like the first thing I always did when I had a business idea was I would make the website for the business. So the fact that I went on to study computer science, I mean, it, in hindsight, it kind of makes sense, even though at the time I didn't really see any kind of relation. Um, and we had some neighbors too that we would try to sell jewelry with. I remember walking to a Barnes and Noble and being like, can we sell outside your Barnes and Noble? Can we sell our jewelry? And then be like, you do not have a permit for this. <laughs> like, no, these damn permits always getting in the way. So um, I've always been pretty entrepreneurial. I, I don't really know where that spark came from, but looking back, I've always kind of been like this. Was it, I don't, I mean, cause I don't know as a kid, if you even have that, but it, was it, was it for the like, for the money or was it for the joy like the joy of like just doing something and do you do you have any sense of looking back on that yeah i think i just loved making things um and and the idea that people could buy them was like almost secondary because i like ne almost never got to the point where i was like actually selling things i just like would have these ideas make the item make the website and then move on to the next idea yeah. Um, so I think I just love the creativity of it all. My mom has always been extremely creative and I think I get a lot of that from her and she, um, was like running her own photography business for a while. So she kind of, I guess, was an entrepreneur in that sense, I guess, looking back. Um, but no, I don't think it was really ever about the money. I think with my big, good business in fifth grade, I made like $50 and had brought this like fake, like team of my friends on with me which I definitely shouldn't have. I definitely baked all the big goods, but I think I ended up splitting that $50 like four ways. So maybe like 12 50. And that was yeah. like, yeah. That's funny. Uh, as you, you know, got to high school and stuff like that, can you talk about the process of uh, choosing BU? You know, obviously I'm not sure if that's the most known school in, in, in Maryland. And, you know, there's a lot of options in DC. How, how'd you end up landing at uh, BU? Yeah, so I only applied to schools that were in cities. Um, I just have always been a city girl. Um, and so, uh, but like throughout, across the country, I looked at schools uh, in cities across the country in basically every major city. Um, and ended up applying for a bunch. I think I like found BU because I searched like schools in Boston and BU came up and I was like, <laughs> all right, I'll add it to a list. Um, and I knew that, people from my high school had gotten in there before. So I was like, okay, like that's at least a good sign. I could probably get in there. Um, given, you know, we had like the software so I could see like what their SAT score was and what their GPA score is and, and see what mine was in relation. So I was like, okay, I could probably get in here. And um, honestly, I don't think I was like that attached, but looking like I wasn't ever like, oh, I have to go to BU. But it's funny looking back, my mom and I went on a college tour, like we went to a bunch of different schools my, my junior year spring break and um we I think went to like some crazy number like eight schools in like five days <laughs> between Boston and New York oh, and geez. um yeah it's crazy but <laughs> BU was like the one school I like took a photo of and I posted on Instagram and I was like oh like what a beautiful day or whatever the <laughs> one of the BU fun and that was the only school I posted a photo from so it was like kind of like weird like maybe I knew or something, I don't know, but ultimately I got into some schools, didn't get into others, um, was um, kind of doing the like attending the admitted students day and everything like that. And they had one in Virginia. So I lived in Maryland, so it was nearby. So we went to the Virginia admitted students day and they could have brought any professor from the entire university. And there are like, must be like thousands of people who work at BU, right? So they could have brought anybody to be their like faculty representative. The person that they brought was the like, director for for undergraduate studies for the computer science department which is what i knew i wanted to study and i was like 
they could have brought anybody and they brought the one person that would be like helpful for me to meet like that must be a sign so ended up going to visit BU a month later um I, again I was already in it was like just another admitted students day but I wanted to like make sure I like felt right there so I went and and that um, professor was generous enough to have coffee with me and I felt really like welcome there and ended up making that choice and I ended up loving my time there so it worked out really well yeah can you talk about uh so I guess you had a sense that you wanted to be computer science major as a senior in high school what what drew you to that uh because that's a that's a tough major <laughs> yeah. yeah I definitely didn't know what I was getting myself into but um it actually all started in eighth grade I um was going to this all-girls school um and in eighth grade they have a day called make your way there motto for the for the school was find a way or make one so make your way day it's kind of like a career fair so they have alums come back and talk about their jobs and one of the women that came back her name is molly and she works at google in new york and she talked about her job at google and what she does and i was like this is the coolest thing i've ever heard in my entire life i also need to get a job at google being in eighth grade i like didn't have the um perspective to know that you can do anything at Google, right? You can do work in marketing, you can work in business development. I was like, Google's the tech company. I need to know how to program. Mm -hmm. So going into freshman year, I wanted to take a programming class. My school didn't offer any for freshmen. In fact, there was only one and it was for juniors. And it was like a semester long. It wasn't even a full year course. And um, so because we were at all girls school, we were partnering with what's called the online school for girls. It was now called like one schoolhouse. I think, I think they made an online school for boys and then merged them. But, um, I convinced the school to let me take what, what they, all of our classes were called majors. So I convinced them to let me take a sixth major, which was this online programming class. I don't think freshmen really ever did that, but, um, I convinced them to let me take this programming class. Um, my freshman orientation. So that was like over the summer, I convinced them to let me take it get to freshman orientation and uh, one of the teachers is like oh, I heard you were taking this programming class um, we have a 3d printer at the school that nobody's using you should like start a club and I was like okay barely know how to program do not know how to use a 3d printer barely know what a 3d printer is yeah of course I'll start a club so not like three weeks later I was like in the like freshman dean's office being like okay so I'm gonna start a 3d printing club now and so I ended up being president of that for basically my entire time in high school, joined the robotics team, got really into it, um, started attending hackathons, um, like did the whole thing. So like knew when I got to college, I, I wanted to study computer science. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how it, it, it was a long journey, but yeah. Yeah. You, you graduated in, uh, in three years. Was that, uh, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, like, financial or was it just I, I don't know yeah so I had no intention in graduate uh, to de to graduate college in three years I, I fully intended to be there for the four years I maybe have at the end of freshman year was like I could probably do three and a half just because of coming in with APs um and then my sophomore spring I took a fifth class just because it seemed interesting it was like women in politics and that summer I was going to work for the city of Boston so I was like I'm going to be a woman in politics so let me take the class and, and see what I can learn the the internship in the class ended up having like basically nothing to do with each other but that being said I ended up taking the class and then got to like the first week of my what would have been my junior year of college and was like okay next next year so after i finish this year i only have 10 credits left which is at bu is two and a half classes so i was like could i just fit this in and then i could graduate a year early and then start work on my company full time mm -hmm. and at that mm -hmm. point three months before i had decided to launch my own clothing line so i i couldn't tell having tr been like trying to do that well in school that it just like there's too much work that needs to be done um to be sitting in all these classes so that fall, I basically convinced the director of our innovation center on campus to do a directed study with me for the, those two, like two credits, and then um, also signed up for a fifth class. So at that point, I was taking 22 credits, which is five and a half <laughs> classes at VU. Yeah but was able to do my directed study through the business school. So the College of Arts and Sciences, which is what the computer science majors through, they didn't know that I was taking 22 credits um, until I guess I went to like graduate. So I had already done it at that point because you're only allowed to take 20. So I like had gone to the other school to be able to do it. <laughs> and then, 
so that semester I was taking 22 and then in the spring I took 20. So I took five classes, which at that point had been normal. I'd already done them for three semesters. So um, was able to fit those 10 credits into my junior year and then graduate year early, which ended up graduating during the pandemic. So like graduating quotation marks, I have a diploma, but never walked um, and, and it ended up working out. And all my friends are at school who are at school now are like, well, you're lucky you got out, so. <laughs> oh, that's cool, that's, that's cool. What was it like going to school in the city? Uh, I went to, to BC, which was in the <laughs> suburbs. So I've always been curious about what, what it's like to go, you know, cause BU is immersed into Boston. Yeah, I think it's really easy to stay in, in like a BU bubble. I mean, even though it's in the city, it's really easy to never get off campus. But I think having my company and, and being so immersed in the world of entrepreneurship, I was kind of always finding ways to get off campus and go to talks and events and, and things like that. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the, the train like went through campus, so you could basically hop on anywhere and, and get downtown and go out to eat with your friends and go to Fenway and um, I think it was a really good fit for me. I never really felt like I was too far isolated from anything. And if there was something happening in Boston, I could just hop on the train and go to it. Um, my, what would have been February of, of my essentially senior year, I, I joined the wing, which is this like female co-working space, which has kind of like fallen apart now. Um, but um, <laughs> I, I would go there most nights and on the weekend um, as well, just to get off campus and kind of get away and, and work on stuff. So um, especially right at the very, very end of college, I mean, honestly, the month of like halfway through February to like halfway through March, I was off campus a lot. Um, it's just spending like all day there getting work done. And I also um, went to this dance cardio um, hip hop workout class called 305 Fitness, um, which is in Kenmore um, Square. So that was, a, it was like barely off campus, it's basically still on campus. In fact, my sophomore year, my dorm was like two minutes across the street from it. But um, that was the other big thing that I did that was like not on campus. And I would go there most mornings at like seven in, in the morning and, and do this like cardio hip hop workout dance class. So yeah, nice, nice. All right. So let's let's transition to why the people are listening. You know, it's about hold hold that. Um, you know, I guess just uh, talk about where that that journey started. Uh, I know that I read that it, it started with the collective and then it pivoted several times. So maybe give people, you know, it's a you know, the long history, I guess. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can, I can do the long version. So <laughs> um, my senior year of high school, I was taking a shower one day. I like to say that's where I have all, all my best thoughts. And I... Um, realized that every time I left the house, I had to carry my phone and my keys and my wallet and my hands are in a purse. And none of my male friends ever had to do that. And it, it's so funny telling the story because I, I always started that exact same way. And I look back and I'm like, what male friends? You went to an all girls school. But <laughs> I had some, I had some. So I, I had enough to, to realize that, you know, they always had pockets that I never did. Yeah. And I decided I wanted to do something about it. And I was in high school and my school was great and I loved it, but they basically had no entrepreneurial resources available for students. So I was like, okay, I'm going to BU in the fall. I'll just work on the idea when I get there. So got to BU, um, started talking about the idea to all my female friends. They were like, yes, I experience this problem every single day. I never have anywhere to carry any of my belongings. Please do something about this. So I decided I want to do something about it. I was studying computer science, obviously. So wanted to come up, my wheelhouse was to come up with a technical solution for this otherwise physical problem. So started with um, compiling, uh, like aggregating clothes in a newsletter from around the internet. So I would go to like forever21.com and madewell.com and jcrew and Nordstrom. And I would find photos where the model's hand was like mostly in her pocket. Can, can I just, stop oh. you for a second? Yeah. Just for a second. So I'm, I'm curious because what was the, what was your incentive to start, right? Because a lot of people see a lot of problems mm -hmm. and uh, what was... I mean, what were you like, did you even know or were you just like, I want to provide resources to females who are looking for, you know, adequate pocket? Like, what was, do you remember that, what, what you were thinking at that time? That's a great question. I think I knew that I experienced the problem every day and I wanted to make it easier for myself. And I knew that talking to all my female friends, they were experiencing the problem every day. 
and and I wanted to solve it for them. I mean, even when I was in high school that spring, I was talking about this this problem all the time, and people were like, "Yes, I experience this problem every single day." And I thought, I, I don't even know if I was thinking about the money at that point. I think I like that the it that it could be a business. I think I just was like, "Can I solve this?" Because when I started to put the clothes in a newsletter, we were not making any money like nothing. I mean, I wasn't paying for MailChimp, but I was paying for like a domain where people could like subscribe to the um, newsletter. But I mean, I wasn't making any money. I just like yeah. wanted to, to start it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. And then, and so uh, continue as you were you talking about. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, at the time, yeah, it was called the collective. I, I thought that name was brilliant at the time. I was like, collectively women want clothing with pockets i was like collecting clothes with pockets pockets collecting because like th there's no greater name so i that summer got into bu summer accelerator so i guess at some point between starting the newsletter and that and applying to the accelerator i knew that i was starting a business again we were not making any money so and there was no clear way to make money so i don't really know what i don't know i guess i was encouraged to apply to the accelerator so i did yeah, yeah. So applied to the accelerator, got in. I think I was one of like two freshmen that were there and um, basically ended up taking what we were doing in the newsletter and, and I built it into a website. So you could then not just get in the newsletter once a week, you could then go and see these clothes all the time. I started using affiliate marketing. I found like an online tool. And so um, that could like connect me to the store. So basically every time someone clicked on something on my website, like a piece of you know clothing, I would make like maybe two pennies. <laughs> I mean, it was so, so low. Yeah. yeah. That by the time I got to the end of the summer, we had had like 5,000 organic website views and I made $6. <laughs> so I, I mean, it was just so yeah. low. Um, and, and I so distinctly remember going to a panel that summer or like a workshop or something downtown about venture capital, which I knew so little about at that time. And I remember talking them talking about investing millions of dollars to make something happen. And me being like, I have no expenses. I, I, I also don't make any money. Like maybe I'm doing something wrong. And not that like, you know, every business needs to be venture backable. Absolutely not. But the the idea that maybe something needed to change was like big like I, that was I was definitely sitting with that so reached the end of the summer know something else needs to be done for some reason get like really excited about this idea of starting a subscription box I think I was like what if we could bring the clothes with pockets directly to women and then they wouldn't need to go shopping for them and I was like oh it's brilliant that fall, I was in a fellowship program through the computer science department um, at, through a program called BU Spark, which I worked at. I worked at BU Spark for my entire time in, in college, nearly except for the first six months, but um, with, got into that fellowship program and then was like, oh, I'm going to start the subscription box. Doing a subscription box require, requires you to have like a lot of machine learning and all this stuff to like predict, you know, the right clothes that you should send to people. And so I had a teammate working with me who knew how to do machine learning, even though I didn't know what to do. And I was like, it's this great idea. Um, there's this guy, his name's Phil Libin. He started Evernote. He is a BU, well, he's almost a BU alum. He was like one credit short. So he was like volunteering with BU Spark to like get this credit so he could graduate. So he w did one-on-one -on -one sessions with everyone in this fellowship program. So it's like this really great entrepreneur, right? And so I came with my idea and he like loved the idea actually, but he was like, the time for subscription boxes is over. He was like, you need to pick something else. Like this, this is not it. And I was like, okay, like, I don't know really what to do with this information, but thank you, Phil Levin. So I basically then was like, okay, well, I can't do a subscription box now. The time has passed. Like the market's overcrowded. Like I don't want to be, I don't want to enter a really crowded market, ironic given where we've landed. But I, he, he was like, what you should do is aggregate, but just from Amazon and you should have pages automatically update as page, as people pull stuff, like post stuff on Amazon. So then you have this like curated collection loosely something. I, I don't remember the idea. It never really, really took shape, but started working on that got it mostly up and running so by the end of the semester when I had to do like a presentation I like had something but I also was like I'm just giving more business to Amazon now like I would make like seven percent every time someone bought something off the website but it also never really went live so I never really made any money from that but I was like I'm just giving more business to Amazon like this idea it's like maybe it could help validate something and I definitely learned from the experience but I also was like I'm just making Jeff Bezos richer like this is not fulfilling <laughs> And, and, you know, what you had asked before, like, why did you start the newsletter? Like, I think a lot of it was like fulfilling to me that I could solve this problem for women. 
And so a lot of it had always been around like the mission behind it. And this iteration at the time was like, not it for me. Yeah. So I then spent the next like semester, I could do like a continuing fellows program from the fellowship. So I would meet with a couple other people who wanted to keep working on their ideas every week. So I then basically spent that semester being like, okay, this is like the sixth time we pivoted. I was like, okay, what if we aggregate clothes from independent designers? So like individuals who are making clothes with pockets. So kind of like an Etsy, but for clothes with pockets. And that in hindsight might've been a good idea, but I didn't know where to find independent designers. I didn't know enough about the fashion space. I, I was like, can I contact schools and they can just give me the names of students who make clothes? Like, should I just hunt down people on Etsy and bring them over to my platform? I mean, I wanted to basically start a marketplace, yeah. um, but didn't know that it was called a marketplace. Didn't, right, like didn't know anything. And so got to the end of the semester, had to demo what I was doing, just like I had the previous semester. And um, in the spring, the fellowship program does a, a special like demo at the end. And, and that one is, is more like pitch style. So it's called dolphin tank. So it's like pit, a shark tank, but they're supposed to be nice mm. to you. <laughs> and um, was able to have like an ask for the judges. So, so we pitch idea and then we, we ask a question to get feedback on it. And so my question was like, would it make more sense to let all these independent designers manufacture the clothes themselves or should I just manufacture them myself? And they were like, oh, you should just manufacture yourself. It's one supply chain for you to oversee. Um, I guess at the time I was pitching it that like I would be overseeing like every single person's manufacturing process. In hindsight, probably not. But they were like, oh, it's just one supply chain to manage. You should just do it yourself. I don't, I, I wish I could like more clearly map out what my brain process was at this point. But I basically walked away from that event being like, if I'm going to design, like if I'm going to manufacture myself, I might as well design myself. I might as well just do all the design. At that point, I might as well just launch my own clothing line. I mean, I don't really know what I was thinking. Like, I knew nothing about starting a clothing line. I mean, nothing. And so, but but somehow I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to go launch a clothing line. And I kid you, I immediately started telling people that's what I was doing. Immediately. I was like, oh, I'm starting a clothing line now. Yeah which worked out really well for me because um, uh, I was part of a Christian fellowship group on campus. And one of the guys who kind of, the adult people who kind of like oversaw the whole thing, knew this guy who was a fashion professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. Connected with me with him and then we were like off to the races, but I, I don't know where I had all the confidence to be like, well, I'm starting a clothing line now. I did not know what I was doing. But that's like kind of how we got yeah. to where we are now. Yeah, yeah. No, Not now, but where we were yeah. 18 months ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense in the sense that it, I guess you control more of, you control pretty much all the aspects of, you don't have to rely on someone else, uh, at, you know, to manufacture or to yeah. produce or design. That makes sense. Um, I guess, how is... Like, I guess, how, what's been the hardest part uh, now, now with, with, this is now the company, right? So now what's been, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's been a lot of challenges, but, you know, you're designing fashion, you're managing people, you know, how, how is, you know, what, what's been some of the challenges that you've been going through the last year? Yeah, so I decided to launch my own clothing line May 2019. Fast forward like 10 months, I have gotten the patterns done. I've like made um like I made some choices around fabric. I've gone through worked with two different agencies at the time. And um, we're like maybe getting somewhere um, as far as getting these this first two pieces. And we, we decided to start with a blazer and pants. So we're maybe getting somewhere and getting these two pieces off the ground. And then COVID hits. And so I not only had to figure out how to launch a clothing line, I had to figure out how to launch a clothing line during a global pandemic. And um, I actually kind of feel like I knew COVID was coming like before it came. I um, had suppliers um, in China that I had met at a trade show in New York and was trying to communicate with them. And Chinese New Year just kept getting extended and extended and extended because of COVID basically. And then COVID was happening. So then Chinese New Year was kind of over, but then COVID was like very present. So it was taking me months, like from like January all the way to like the end of February to like even get fabric out of China 
to be able to make a sample. And, and it's so funny looking back because I, I did, took an Instagram photo and posted it and, and it's me like on the phone, um, but it's like a, like one of those old fashioned phones. And the caption is like, anyone else's supplier call them to tell them that coronavirus is over. Over, that was like February. Like I had <laughs> no idea, but I was like, oh, it's over in China, it's done, right? It's done. And so I think that that is just like one very drawn out example. I mean, COVID had so, such a broad ranging, like wide ranging effect, but I think that that's one example of like the continuous process that you have being an entrepreneur of creating a plan, setting expectations for where you're going to be, and then always being somewhere else. And it's not that you're always like behind, it's not that you don't always hit expectations, but it's that you have to readjust them. And you, you often end up going in a different direction because of, you know, whatever reason. And so whether that was COVID, whether that was with my team or um, the fabric that I wanted to use or where I wanted to manufacture, I mean, over and over, it, I had to readjust expectations with like the new information that I had and, and proceed accordingly. I think one of the hardest parts of getting hold that off the ground was that for the first like year from like May to May, right, I was still in school. Um, and so going from being in school to being a full time entrepreneur is something that like I do not I was not prepared for at all. It's, it's just so, so different going from working in your company, maybe 10, 20 hours a week, fitting it in between your classes. And I had an on campus job and, you know, I was I was leading clubs like I was busy and, and going from doing that to to working on your company full time. It's the only thing on your plate. Uh, if, if you don't like make, if you're not working, the company's not moving forward, right? And, and that was always the case, but you feel it so much more when like you wake up every morning and you're going to work on your company. And it was a lot to like figure out because I think of like the, the startup like hustle culture that exists. I was like, if I'm not working all the time, then I'm failing. I'm, I'm basically leading my company into the ground. And, and balancing that with like, if I do not take a break, then I will also run my company to the ground because I'll be exhausted and I'll only be able to last, you know, half as long before I can't do this anymore. And so I think I've had to learn how to like balance all of those things. And then on top of that, during the global pandemic, and I've had to live at home and it's <laughs> not been what I wanted at all. Um, but like learning how to make the most of it, learning how to adjust. Um, I think that's, that's really at the crux of like what it, being an entrepreneur is, is like being as flexible as possible because the plan that you set for yourself, like you will not be able to follow, not because, I mean, sometimes because of yourself, many times not because of yourself, but because of all these external factors that are at play. It, was there a point at which, you know, you said to yourself, like, I'm for sure doing this out of school like that because that's not a common path for recent grads to to start their own business. And, you know, I think parents might also might want you to do something more safe. Like, was there ever or were you just so driven by the mission that you really didn't hesitate? Yeah, I think my fall of what ended up being my senior year, but should have been my junior year, I I could see that I was Get, spending all this time trying to get these first patterns and this first muslin sample and source all this fabric and and make this happen and I didn't really see a world in which I could like graduate college and go get a job and still have to do this part-time like it was exhausting to have to like balance everything and I was like I just want a chance to to get to work on it all the time and and just give that a shot and I definitely wasn't always so secure about the decision especially having studied CS and seeing all my friends interview, travel for interviews, um, talk about the job offers they were getting, which start in like the six figures with like a twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 signing bonus and being like, like I'm get, I basically am giving that up to go and, and do this. And I think that's why people say that to be an entrepreneur to be like a little crazy, like, like Loki, like very crazy. <laughs> um, because how do you walk away from like that potential, like that future that, that could have been that I worked for three years to get this degree to, to then not use it? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think I just was like so convicted that I had this idea and that I, I wasn't gonna put all this in only to, to like half ass it basically when I graduated. Like I, I couldn't bear the thought of like having to do, to do something else nine to five only to get to work on this part-time like I had to for the past like three years and and so that just like really drove me to 
want to do it. I think also I had like started to fall in love with the idea of working for myself, which um, I think also takes kind of a crazy person to like do because it's very difficult. Um, but I, I just also like wasn't really excited about the idea of going and, and making somebody else's dream come true when I had this own dream that I wanted to make possible. Yeah. Um, you know, in that line, how have you managed being a young CEO? You know, you're managing people and um, I'm sure there are, when you're working with suppliers, they're looking at your young face and kind of doubting, you know, what you're, you're doing. How have you managed that, you know, stereotype of not being a seasoned, you know, 50 year old CEO? Mm. I think I struggled with it for a while, especially because there's this question when, if you ever build a pitch deck, um, you have to basically put together a slide, which is your team. And, and the question is always when you're giving your, when you're telling your story, when you're explaining your pitch deck, why are you the most qualified person to go and do this? And I, for like my entire time, like trying to get hold that off the ground, I was like, I'm not like, I, there's so many people who've worked in fashion longer than me. They know more about this space than I do. They've worked for like other direct to consumer companies and they know more about marketing and they know about more about all this other stuff. And then I, you know, really only within the last couple of months as, as everything's kind of taken shape and, and we've ended up building a community and um, around what we're doing and all this stuff, the more I realize like, I am the most qualified person to do this because my customer is literally myself, right? Like I'm selling to women who have just graduated college and are going to get their first job. I have just graduated college and I'm now in my first job. Yeah, it's not a corporate job, so it's not quite the same, but I have, I'm in the exact headspace of the woman that I'm trying to reach. And so every time I write copy, every time my team writes an Instagram post, every time we like write an email, like everything, like I can speak directly to my customer because she's like basically my best friend, right? Like we're, we're the same person. And so um, you can't, you can't talk to someone in the same way like that. And I couldn't probably have built the community that I was building if, if I was like 30 years old, right? Like I'm able to do the things that I am able to do because I am young and I, and I realized I like had to turn that into an advantage for myself and be able to understand that. I would say for like the supplier side of things, um, there's definitely been times where I've been like taken advantage of because like I have a lack of knowledge around something and I'm very grateful for mentors who have been like, no, that makes no sense. <laughs> like that should have happened already or they shouldn't be like, you know, doing that. Like this is the way it actually should be done because they know more than I do. And I think that's why you get mentors, right? It's, it's you're craving that, you need that advice. But at the same time, I've also been able to do so many things where I'm like, are you sure? Like I'm pretty young, like, are you sure? And, and I recently, a couple weeks ago, I got off a call um, with a partner of ours and, and they were like, yeah. And then there's like sea freight and then, you know, air freight. And we'll probably want to ship by sea and me being like, I'm 21 years old. Like, like what, like, are you really letting a 21 year old like ship clothes by sea from China? Like, does that really make sense? And, and obviously I didn't say that, but I, you know, I, I left that meeting being like, that's crazy. And then I was like, did you, I don't know if you ever saw the show Phineas and Ferb, but on the show Phineas and Ferb, they built roller coasters and machines to talk to animals and all this stuff. And they always have the, the, this like supplies delivered. And so the delivery person always gets there and they're like, aren't you a little bit young to be doing this? And they're like, yes, yes, we are. That is how distinctly how I feel a large portion of the time. And I, I do want to clarify that it's not imposter syndrome. I know that I'm working really, really hard for what I'm doing. It's genuine bafflement that I'm like able to get away with the things that I'm able to get away with. Like someone will do something or like I'll have a conversation and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. This isn't happening faster. Like I'm working really hard for you. And I'm like, you're 20 years older than me. And you're like apologizing to me for like not being able to make something happen. Like, who, like, I didn't take a test to be able to do this. Like, who permitted me to be able to wield such power and such confidence? And it, it's like, I honestly feel like so blessed that I'm like able to do all this and also like grateful, but also like shocked, uh, honestly, all the time that I'm able to get away with this. And honestly, it's kind of what makes the job pretty fun. No, that, those were some great points, you know, especially with the purpose of the, the company and, um, you know, your customer, there's no better person to work for them. And then, you know, honestly, I think the, the stereotype against being young makes like very little sense in terms of like 
everyone makes mistakes when they're building a bit. I mean, everyone learns, so it's really not about age. Um, you know, obviously you're a female founder. How has um, that been? I mean, obviously it, it's kind of well documented in the, you know, the history of, you know, we talked about VC and stuff like that, that, you know, it's a lot tougher for female founders to even um, be heard. And then, you know, you, you, you hear stories of like Spanx and, you know, Sarah Blakely trying to convince the, the supplier to, to even make it. And then the guy, the guy who she's talking to, you know, talks to his daughters and then only because of that, he agrees to do it. So has that been something that you've been self-aware of, of in your interactions or, or something like that? Sure, and I think it's important, um, at least what I've discovered, to distinguish between female founders who are building products for other women and then female pro female founders who are building products for anybody or, or even for men, right? Because when it comes down to it, like you're a lot of times when you're telling your story, trying to convince others that it's worth investing either their time, money, interest, whatever. And a lot of the ability to convince them of that comes down to their ability to relate to the problem. So if it's just for women, you, you kind of have this other barrier where they're like, I will never experience this problem. And so that's, I think, why, you know, Sarah Blakely, like th that investor um, had to be like, let me see what my daughters think, right? And, and a lot of times what I have to end up doing is being like, have you ever had to carry like your girlfriend or like your wife or, you know, female friends, have you ever had to carry her phone? in your pocket and they're like oh yeah and i'm like okay so you do get it right you do get it and and trying to convince them that that problem is actually very big and there's actually like a monetary um value associated with that that lack of functionality and so a lot of times i'll, I'll find myself adding a lot of numbers and data and, and all this stuff to back up what i'm saying because the simple act of storytelling is often not enough um to, to pull emotionally on kind of the the like wanting them to to invest in in me um, and I'll, to date that's mostly been you know time and and mentorship i mean there's been some times where i've pitched and it's hard especially in boston where i am right now um it's very big on like health tech biotech we have like almost no, no direct to consumer or like consumer packaged goods here so there's a from everybody men and women there, there's like a you know lack of knowledge around this area to begin with but you know there's pitch competitions i've done where more than 50% of the panel of the, sorry, of the people pitching have been women, but um, all of the men have ended up placing and, and like one woman has, right? Like, like stuff like that happens and you're like, was it the people on the judging panel? Was it the way I communicated my idea? And um, you, at that point, you kind of have to separate like the value of the company with the value of yourself and, and them not seeing value in, in the company is not that they didn't see value in me and not that my company is not valuable, but that they, they, you know, maybe just couldn't get past biases or um, lack of understanding. And so um, we're going to raise a pre-seed round in the beginning of the new year. And, you know, it's really my intention to pitch to as many women as possible. One, because I want my cap table to have women on it, but two, because I know I'll just have an easier time if I don't have to convince people that my problem exists before I to, before I need to convince them that they should invest in it, right? It's that whole extra conversation that needs to be had. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things that just kind of like exists and I'm kind of like used to it. Um, and, and I'm so rarely caught off guard, um, but I'm still, it's still like frustrating when, when it happens. I mean, I remember having one conversation where a guy was like, um, you know, having pockets in clothing, like that kind of reminds me of having like air conditioning or sorry, it reminds me of having like paint on the color of a car. Like, it's not really, a, it's not really like a need, like it's not air conditioning. Like you need air conditioning, but you don't need like your car to be a certain color. And he was like, that's what pockets are. Pockets are the paint. And I, I kid you not, like I watched him immediately take his phone and put it into his jacket pocket. And I was like, I could never like, like you understand like what you're telling me right now is like, you don't think that my idea is, is valuable or of need. And you literally just used what essentially is my solution. And it's stuff like that, where it's like, you have to then strike a balance between being like polite and being like, are you kidding? So <laughs> I feel like that's what being a female founder is all the time. Are you kidding? Yeah. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, we didn't get into this, but, uh, especially, you know, 
uh, for the the listeners out there, can you talk about the the products you're offering and and probably will offer you know this next up coming year as well? Yeah. So we're launching in January with first uh, two pieces to start: a blazer and pants. The blazer has six functional pockets, two on the outside, four on the inside, and the pants have two front pockets um, that are like so deep. Um, and we also, for now, are like one, or we're selling masks. Those I think will probably um, sell out pretty quickly, but um, those are, are basically where we're starting. And then we have plans for work from home slash work appropriate joggers um, that are like um, softer on the inside, but look professional on the outside. And we have plans for like a jumpsuit where um, there's like basically a crop top over the top of the jumpsuit, which has a zipper underneath. So you can take it off without being naked when you go to the bathroom, which is like another random functionality issue that women's clothing has. Um, but yeah, starting with the blazer and pants. Cool, cool. Um, and the other thing I saw was back pocket community. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? I'd love to. So we started back pocket in April, um, 2020 when COVID was basically spreading across the United States and everyone who was in college was being sent home and everyone who was already working was basically now working from home if they could. And we thought, okay, at a time when everybody is, is now basically by themselves and not meeting any new people, how can we kind of turn that on their head and have them meet more connections than they have before? And so, and, and simultaneously further and live out our mission of supporting women from the moment that they get dressed. We've always said, you know, we want to be there when you, when you get dressed, we want you to put on our clothes, but we want to be there for all the moments after as well, because we know your day doesn't end. So we launched Back Pocket. It started as just a membership only community. Um, and then in August, we ended up opening um, our Slack community and some of our workshops up to the public, but to like draw people in and, and, and make it more accessible. But we offer a lot of different programming all around, mostly career focused, but um, some more like networking and community driven. So we do, um, monthly workshops i'll focus on like a career related topic so we've done like how to get a job during COVID 19 how to ace your zoom interview kind of like timely stuff um and then we do industry cohorts so people in the same industry can get together and share advice and get help and feedback we do coffee chats so you can meet with people uh, most like all women who are like further along in their careers but you know who who can do like one-off mentorship and then with one of our membership tiers you get your own mentor um who's in your field but a couple years further along we have a book club um where we read a book by a female author every month and we also have a podcast club where we just listen to a podcast and talk about it as if it was a book but the you know time commitment to prepare is much lower um and yeah it's all hosted on slack so i think we're at like just over 420 members right now um but having a, a good time and it's it's been so exciting to like see the effects of of this it's kind of like separate from the clothing side of things is we had like one girl whose mentor worked at a, um, a company and and the girl who was the mentee ended up getting a job at that company um and and we've had another panelist um for one of our public events from Deloitte. She ended up hiring two women from our community. I mean, it's stuff like this where it's like, I never expected for this to happen, but do you have like stars align and and, and it, we've like made this possible for these women. And it, it's like incredibly motivating and uplifting and makes you want to keep working even when things are hard. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that reminds me of like, uh, you often hear like the boys club and golfing. And I think you're doing the modern day female version, which is awesome. Um, as you look to the future of hold it, what do you hope, um, you know, what would be the perfect scenario? So I have a lot of grand visions. I think the like overarching thing is I want to be like a go-to resource for that transition into adulthood. As you say that, you know, point from like graduating college or, or, you know, starting your first job from like a workwear perspective and we want to you know be there to, to outfit you and um also be there from a building up you internally we all we have this like joke which is like supporting women from the outside in um because the inside out because uh, we, we make the clothes but um be like the kind of go-to place for that i mean i have like a lot of kind of like next like a hundred miles, like visions of these like chapters that we have in different cities. So um, if you move to a new city for your new job and you're like, I'm not gonna make any friends. Well, 
oh look a built-in you know back pocket chapter in seattle or in chicago mm, and that would be awesome up, yeah right and then yeah, yeah, yeah. college chapters too so um you can like be in like the boss Boston College. Okay, it's called Boston <laughs> University chapter, but um, uh, the Boston area chapter, and and you're there when you're in college and you graduate, and maybe you're staying in Boston, so now you could join the Boston like adulthood chapter or whatever it's called. Um, I also have visions of like a retail space one day, and I know retail is like low key dying, but only because it's not experience based. So I have this idea for a, like a physical space where it's like you walk in and it doesn't really look like a store; it just kind of looks like a living room. And we have couches, and we like always have fresh baked cookies. And we have clothes and we're like low-key selling to you, but like not really. And in the back, we have co-working space for like people to actually work or for startups to get off the ground. So we're like paying it forward. And um, this just like space for people to connect. We can host events. And I don't know, I, I for me, it's like, I yes, we make clothes, but I feel like we're like a company that makes clothes as opposed to like a clothing company. Like, I think it's so much more than that. I think like this like Generation Z, right? Gen Z, that's like transitioning into adulthood is doing so at such a tumultuous time with the pandemic, with like this recession, um, with everyone basically at home right now. And, and how can we like help make that a little bit easier um, for, for, you know, women across the country? Like that like jazz me up more than anything. So I just want to be there as much as we can to be helpful and, and be supportive. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it, it, it comes clear from just listening from you that you're very purpose driven um, and ambitious in, in the right way, you know, for the right reasons. I'm just curious uh, on a, this personal, like selfish question, you know, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you, how, are, how do you turn off? How do you uh, not be on all the time? Cause I'm, I mean, you're a human being too, you know? Absolutely. And it's, it's so funny. I have so many friends who are like, do you even sleep? And I'm like, yeah, I get eight hours of sleep at least every night because I, first of all, don't really believe in naps, but I, um, I need the energy to, to, to be able to do all the work that I'm doing. And um, I think what's so great about the community that we've built is that I get to like be human. I don't have to like be this like illustrious CEO. And, you know, we had a, a little like industry cohort call the other week with, um, women who are interested in entrepreneurship and they're like Sarah like how are you taking care of yourself like how's your mental health and I was like okay like you guys want to take care of me as much as I want to take care of you right yeah. and so it's, I don't have to like put on a show with this community sometimes if we're like announcing something new I'll just like record a video of myself so like we can build this like human to human contact um and 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 I think the fact that I can be real with the community that we've built, I don't have to like be somebody else means I don't really have to turn anything like on or off. Right. I can just like be, and then they're like excited about that. Um, and there's plenty of ways that I unwind. I would say, okay, I got into reading um, during quarantine, which is like mostly just because we, we launched a book club, but um, it's been nice to be able to read, even though I'm low key working while I'm reading because I need to read for the book club. Um, I have various Netflix shows that I binge, just like, every other 21 year old, you know, I'm yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, and, and being home, I've spent a lot of time with my family um, because I have to, because they're here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and like I said, we've always been close. So it's, it's not really been bad or anything, but um, there's, yeah, plenty of ways I unwind. I would, I would say the thing about being a CEO is, is, and I talked about that like hustle culture before is people are like, oh, entrepreneurs, they, they work 24 seven. I don't think I work 24 seven. I think my brain works 24 seven. I mean, I'll be like going to bed and I'll like have an idea. So I'll like text someone on my team the idea and be like, okay, don't respond, but we'll talk about it on Monday. And it's always that kind of thing. Like basically always thinking like, as soon as my, I wake up, even if my eyes aren't awake, my like brain starts like running basically again. I'm yeah. like, okay, here are like three things we need to do. And, 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 and I think you can't, have that mentality if you're not excited about the work that you're doing right and and i'm so lucky to love my job even when it's hard even when it's so so frustrating um i still you know can join our slack community and be like hey everybody what's up and then they'll be like we love you like we're here for you right yeah so it, it's able to like sustain me in a way that that i think is like healthy yeah yeah awesome you know i guess for you know there are going to be some young female listeners, right? Uh, do you, you have any, you know, just general advice on uh, what you've learned in, in this journey? And, um, you know, maybe if they have any insecurity on, on starting their journey, 
just any any advice there yeah i think i i don't know if it's like just the circles that i run in or whatever but i feel like i'm in so many conversations all the time uh, probably at least monthly about imposter syndrome and this idea that women suffer from imposter syndrome all the time and um we are constantly told that we're like not supposed to be in the places that we are and I think that's true. I think we are constantly told that. And I think that's why like basically every woman suffers from imposter syndrome. But I also think it's like low key okay to feel that way. If you are feel like you're like going in the direction you want to be going, right? Let's say that you're like a junior software engineer and you want to be a senior software engineer. You can't compare yourself to the senior software engineer and be like, I'm not there yet, even though, cause you're not there yet, right? But if you're working hard and you're like learning new things and you're like working towards it, then you're going to get there. Like there's nothing besides like whatever, all the normal things standing in your way, like you yourself cannot stand in your own way to get there. And, and I think that's something I've like dealt with and discovered is like, if I want hold that to like go somewhere and, and be something, then I just need to like work for it and like get there. And maybe that's like idealistic, but I think it's just like, I think you have to feel uncomfortable to make progress. And I think that that gets misbranded as imposter syndrome sometimes. But the fact of the matter is like, you're supposed to be where you are right now and you're supposed to get to where you're going. So it, like get comfortable being uncomfortable is I think like the takeaway here. Um, because once you get comfortable with that, then the limits are like, there really are no limits. If you're like, uh, if you're comfortable pushing yourself and like working really hard to like get where you're going, you can get basically anywhere all other factors like holding steady right yep. um and and i think that's just worth remembering um because i think i think a lot of times we're told that like there's all these other external factors at play and people are like oh women only get two percent of vc funding and all stuff and i'm like yeah but like let me just go out and pitch like let me try right because because you won't get anywhere unless you work for it right period and unless you like are willing to like push the limits. And I think that like boiled down for me, like so early when I was starting hold that I had people be like, if I knew what it took to start in clothing line, I never would have done it. I literally heard that and was like, well, I'm going to do it. Like, that seems about right. Like, I'm like, I can do it. Like, why not? Right. Yeah, of course, it's really hard. I'm sure that's why they said that. But you're in a very idea, like in like all again all other things holding steady the only thing holding yourself back is yourself so just like work for it and like get there and like reach out when you need help but like you can get there you can yeah no that's that's great advice just control what you can control control exactly. your work ethic control what you're working um how hard you're working that's that's great advice uh sarah we t we talked about a good amount was there anything we didn't hit on that you wanted to talk about no, I, I don't think so. This is incredibly comprehensive. But if anyone's listening, I would love to meet you. I, I say this thing sometimes. I like talk to college students a lot, which I say as if I'm like 40 years old. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, we have like a lot of college partners that I'll go and talk with. But I always say um, entrepreneurs, like there's this illusion around them that they're like super busy all the time. But we literally set our own schedules. So if we're busy, it's just because we put that on our own plate. So if you want to talk to someone who's an entrepreneur, like suggest the time to meet like two weeks out when they probably won't have as much scheduled and you could probably get time on their calendar. I meet with people who like want to start business all the time. So if anything I said, like Loki resonated, Heike resonated with you, like reach out because I'm like super accessible. Um, and I like love talking to people about getting their businesses off the ground. Also, I think that advice applies to like basically most entrepreneurs is like Loki, they're available. Yeah, so. no, that's awesome. Uh, do you, actually, do you want to just talk about uh, for those people that might want to follow Hold, hold That, um, follow you, uh, where can they do that? Yeah, I'm at Sarah Graysdorf on everything. Um, Instagram, Loki Twitter, but like not really. And uh, LinkedIn. Just that, just like right in the message where you like heard about me, um, and you can follow Holdet. Um, one of the reasons we picked the name Holdet from the collective, which we didn't really get into, but um, was because we could get the handle on every single platform and get the trademark. So um, we're at Holdet on everything as well. Um, if you identify as female or femme non-binary, you should join our Slack community. You can just Slack DM me anytime. I'm on Slack too often, so I'm available on there as well. Um, and I think if you just go. I like click email on our Instagram thing. I think it just goes straight to my, my email. So um, anyone can email me as well. Yeah, yeah. Sarah, uh, thank you so much for being on. I just want to acknowledge you. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm glad Katie, Katie connected us because uh, 
it's been awesome hearing your your journey and uh um uh, your your passion for creating you know a female community female workwear that you know provides adequate pockets and um i hope all of i i don't doubt that all of the visions that uh you hope for will come true just based off of your work ethic so thank you so much for being on oh thank you so much and and thanks for having me of course thank you